special thanks to Endy and Friends for providing us with today's MSM Draw. Submit a drawing prompt with the hashtag MSM Draw in this video for a chance for it to be drawn in the next one. I cannot hold it in anymore. I just wanna- I was literally so excited to make this episode. Cephalopods are my absolute favoriteest group of critters ever, and I finally get to nerd out, uh, more than usual, during this episode. Last week's Trouble was a big hit, so I'm hoping that today, uh, we'll get something really popular as well. Hey, awesome, another mythical! I'm very excited. Two mythicals in a row. <laughs> Yes, sir! One of my favorites. Now, at first glance, the Cranchy appears to be based on a squid. That is, in fact, because it is. Although simplified, the Cranchy has two longer arm tentacles that are different from the rest, a characteristic trait of real-world squids. Compared to octopuses, which have eight tentacles, squid have ten, eight tentacles, and two arms. The Monster Handlers put so much research into their monster designs, and I had a wonderful time discovering all the inspirations. To my surprise, the colors of the Cranchy are grounded in biology as well. The captivating crimson coloration that this molluscan monster manages specifically sources supersized cephalopods. <laughs> you gotta get those alliterations out early, otherwise they'll be bugging me all the way through my script writing phase. What I'm trying to say is that the giant and colossal squids, alongside with other deep sea creatures, are often a deep red coloration. If we were to look at the spectrum of electromagnetic radiation, my favorite thing to do, we see that the wavelength is much longer at the left, and then increases as we move right. When we pop into the visible spectrum, notice how red is the longest wavelength of color we can see, while violet is the shortest. The longer a wavelength is, the less energy it has. This means that when sunlight hits the surface of the ocean, higher energy colors punch deeper into the water than lower energy colors. Red light, being a low energy color, doesn't make it past the first 100 meters of water. This means that below the first 100 meters, any deep sea creature colored red doesn't reflect any red light, and instead appears black and camouflaged with the surrounding water. Now's a good time to mention that the Cranchy draws inspiration from both squid and octopuses, exhibiting anatomical features that can be found on both types of animal. On that note, one interesting feature that might be overlooked are the rings that appear on the Cranchy's sides and down its limbs. If we look closely at the rings, we can see that they range from turquoise to sea green. These rings are most likely pulled from the blue ringed octopus. But before I tell you about that, I have to tell you about this. Iridescence is a phenomenon that affects light. Essentially, certain materials can have multiple layers that interfere with light waves reflecting off it. The light gets all wibbly wobbly, and when it hits your eye like a big pizza pie, it appears dazzlingly colorful. The neck feathers of pigeons shine pink and green. Certain beetles are super iridescent, and a ton of fish have it in blue. My family owns some tetras, and they have an iridescent blue stripe down their sides. This iridescence property is exactly what gives the blue-ringed octopus its namesake. The octopus has cells called iridophores in its skin, which give it iridescent properties. The rings of iridophores are surrounded by muscles, and when relaxed, cover the blue parts. When the octopus is threatened, the muscles contract and reveal the super bright blue circles. If this isn't a warning sign enough, then the golf ball sized cephalopod bites you and injects a venom that will completely paralyze you within minutes. <laughs> However, I am disinclined to believe that the Cranchy uses these rings as a warning for potential opponents. We have no evidence that the Dream Ethical is venomous, and we never see the rings expand and contract in its animation, hinting at the fact that these markings are skin deep. There are no muscle contraction shenanigans going on here. Those circles are constantly on display. 
Instead, I believe that the Cranchy uses those circles for an entirely different reason. But in order to tell you that, I need to tell you about this again. Let's move on for a quick minute to look at the eyes of the Cranchy. Like the shimmering aridophore rings adorning the flanks of the monster, the eyes sport a soothing blue-green gradient. Either by coincidence, or by the hand of a developer totally in tune with biology, the Tapetum lucidum also reflects in these colors. The Tapetum lucidum is a tissue structure located at the back of the eyes that allows you to see better in the dark. You can easily see the reflection of the Tapetum lucidum in the back of many nocturnal mammals' eyes. It could mean that the Cranchy, while in water, would want to remain unseen by being red, while conversely seeing everything around it with its iridescent eyes. This could be a potential explanation for the coloration of the Cranchy's eyes, even though the Tapetum lucidum is absent in all types of cephalopod. However, another exciting justification can be found in another awesome type of squid. Behold! I mean, behold! This is the strawberry squid, nature's cheap rocket stock photo. It looks like it's choking on a tennis ball. But that bulbous yellow orb is in fact its left eyeball. The right eyeball is completely different and about half its size. The squid hangs vertically in the dark water with its small eye looking down into the abyss, looking for a glimmer of bioluminescent prey. At the same time, its big eye looks upwards into the water, trying to spot prey as well. The reason its eye is so green is because its lens is tinted with a fluorescent pigment. The big eye is designed to filter out blue light in order to see through the camouflage of bioluminescent food. But before I finish that thought, stay with me here because we're switching topics faster than an indecisive English major, but I gotta explain counterluminescence real quick. A lot of bioluminescent fish and organisms make sure to glow, but only on the bottom. Sort of like how it feels when you sit on a hot seat for too long. At any rate, the bottom side of the animal glows at the same general frequency as the deep diving blue light we talked about earlier. So that means, if you were to look up at a counterluminescing fish, it would effectively blend into the lighter water around it. But not to the strawberry squid. It says, your fancy glow camouflage doesn't fool me, nerd. Using its yellow tinted eye, which filters out blue light, it can spot the shadows of the prey through their own counter luminescence. Talk about a seafood diet. Seafood. And when submersible vehicles make contact with these squids, the strong blue lights emitted by the electric lights make the squid eye glow yellow green. So voila! Maybe the Cranchy has a similar adaptation to help see through the light of the ocean and grab a snack, explaining the colorful eyes of the monster. And that finally explains the multiple aspects of the Cranchy's deep sea inspiration. Just kidding! The strawberry squid also uses its own version of counter-illumination. The little strawberry seeds that give this squid its name are actually little nodes called photophores that produce blue-green light. So just like the animals it eats, the squid also employs the tactic of lighting up its lower half to fool hungry predators lurking below it. These blue-green nodes are exactly what we see on the skin of the Cranchy. So another explanation, besides simply luminescent patches of aridophores, is the theory that they are actually photophores that allow the Cranchy to blend in even more. But we're far from done. Last time I checked, squid and octopuses could not grow hair. And yet, we see what looks to be a stash, beard, and electric shock hairdo on the Cranchy. I theorize that these fibrous protrusions are in fact the gills of this monster. Normally, the gills of a cephalopod are located within the mantle, which is that big squishy head thing. Water enters in through openings between the side of the head and the bottom of the mantle, called the mantle cavity openings, then it swirls around in the mantle, and then it is jetted out through a short tube called the siphon to rocket the animal forwards. I don't think there are any gills within the Cranchy's body, and I don't think that it has mantle cavity openings, and I don't think that it even has a siphon. It seems that for the Cranchy, the head and the mantle are fused into one piece of flesh, with no openings for seawater to enter or exit. 
So therefore, gills have to exist outside of the body as those hair-like protrusions. But that only explains how the Cranchy breathes underwater. How on earth can it survive on land? Well, I'm so glad you asked. In our last video about the Cherubble, check that out if you haven't already, I talk about sea slugs for 10 minutes, we examined the ability of respiration through skin. One might assume that the Cranchy similarly breathes through its skin. However, the Cranchy is a vocal monster, meaning that it needs lungs, or at least an air-filled swim bladder, to boot up a dimbo all day. Surely there's not an animal out there with both gills and lungs, right? This animal has the most creative name of all time, known as the lungfish. This is primarily because the fish has lungs, allowing it to breathe above and below water. It's a neat little application to show that animals are out there that continue to defy expectations. Like the headless chicken monster, that one is worth a Google search. So let's continue talking about the internal anatomy, because there's another really cool squid fact that I want to share with you guys. You may have heard that cephalopods don't have any hard bits in their body, making them an ideal item to throw at someone's face for a practical joke. But then the more academically inclined individuals pointed out that, um, actually, they have a bony beak to rip up prey with. And today, I'm going to one-up them. Um, actually, many species of cephalopods possess a hard, bone-like structure called the gladius, or the pen, primarily composed of chitin. It runs up under the skin near the dorsal side of the squid and provides protection and support. Some species, like the cuttlefish, have an actual fully-fledged calcium bone called the cuttle bone that acts like a protective inner shell. Not all species of cephalopod have a gladius, so how can we determine if the Cranchy has one or not? Well, for one, we can examine the physical features of the monster, starting with those three holes near the top of the mantle. As a fun design feature, we can see that they initially resemble stylized sound waves. But what could these holes possibly be? Well, seeming as the Cranchy presumably keeps its mouth shut and hidden behind its gills, it would have to take in air from someplace else. I think those orifices are the nostrils of the Dream Ethical, especially because we can see them dilating when the Cranchy sings. This confirms that the passages are related to respiration, or at least vocalization. If it really is a nasal cavity, then it would be both. Usually, your skull has a bunch of sinus cavities and resonation chambers to direct the air down into your lungs, but seeming as this monster lacks a skull, and a skeleton in general, I just drew a cartilage tube that siphons air deeper into the body. So how does this relate to the gladius? This structure runs down the front of the squid's body, so if there was one here, then there wouldn't be any way for nostrils to exist there at the same time. Unless the tissue of the gladius is fused with the funnel-like sinuses of the cranchy, which I suppose is a possibility. But it's actually not a possibility, because I didn't tell you about my secret weapon, John Cranch. This dude discovered a family of squid in the 1800s and named it after himself, calling it Cranchiday. Sounds familiar, huh? I had to steal some thunder from this monster's what's in a name video, but only because this pertains to its biology. You see, squids of Cranchiday are known as glass squids, and they lack a gladius. So we can conclude that, being based off of these squids, the Cranchy lacks one as well. But wait, there's more! Because Cranch Day also includes the Colossal Squid, which is red in coloration like the Cranchy, and also has a Gladius for some reason. So we have conflicting evidence all over the place, but I've gone with the majority of Cranch Day and abstained from painting a Gladius of the Cranchy. I wouldn't be surprised if it did though. Let me know what you think in the comments, but hold your horses for now because we still got cool stuff to cover. It is indeed true that squid possess a beak-like structure called a rostrum, which is responsible for slicing and dicing and julienning food into little strips. Past the rostrum, we find our old friend the radula, which is a structure found in all types of mollusk except clams because they hate to follow trends. We talked about radulas in our trouble video, another shameless plug, wink wink, but it essentially serves as a tongue to shove food further into the maw of the squid. For the Cranchy, I don't think it has a beak, because its mouth is just so different from those of other cephalopods. But 
Because of general mollusk knowledge, and bear with me on this one, Budat Badimbo requires a tongue to actually say, we can guess that the Karanchi does in fact have a radula. The digestive tract runs through the middle of the brain, which is shaped like a donut. This is what real cephalopod brains look like, and I reviewed many papers because I don't think anyone really knows why the esophagus goes through the brain. Consider that one of the top 10 questions that science can't answer. Now we can move on to the main event, and perhaps the most exciting feature of the Cranchy. Just what are the mechanisms behind the speaker tech of this monster's tentacles? The Cranchy's speakers, although they look inorganic, are actually very specialized suckers found on the underside of tentacles. Keeping with the fashion, merging squid and octopus features to make this dream ethical, we can confidently confirm that these suckers are based off of those of the octopus rather than the squid. Squid suckers have these little jaws in them that sort of bite down on whatever the squid is grabbing, and octopus suckers act more like a suction cup. We don't see any teeth or anything like that on these suckers, and they are built in the same cup-like shape as octopus suckers. So let's take a second to explain the internal mechanics of these things. Octopus suckers are composed of two sections, the infundibulum, which is the outer bowl-like rim of the sucker, and the acetabulum, which is the deeper, hollow cavity in the muscle above the sucker. When the sucker squishes down over a surface, the rings of muscles surrounding the cavities squish down and create an airtight seal. The round parts on the bottom of the suckers are called the chitinous cuticles. They act as a protective covering for the more sensitive bits of the sucker, like the muscles and the nerves. So, we can see the cuticles of the Cranchy on display, and they look very metallic, don't they? It seems that perhaps metal-infused chitin is not as uncommon of an occurrence as we've seen, because we had that whole topic on our recent Bulbo video. Check that out if you haven't already. But anyway, the Cranchy has metallic cuticles, which, just like a real octopus's, can be shed if they are outgrown. But what does the sucker look like underneath the cuticle when the new speaker head is growing in? Well, just like any other cephalopod, the Cranchy has a fleshy divot absolutely packed with ring-like muscles. Now here's where the cool stuff begins. How do you think, before I explain my idea, how the Cranchy's speakers work? Do you think that they are electric? What about extra throats going down into the tentacles to sing out of the suckers? The true answer is elegantly simple. This sounds kind of weird out of context, but octopus suckers are structurally similar to electronic speakers. To understand that, let's take a quick dip into the world of speakers. Put into its simplest terms, a speaker is a wire coil and a magnet behind a membrane. When current is sent through the wire, it causes its magnetic field to fluctuate moving the speaker head slightly back and forth. All of these super quick vibrations compress the air in front of the membrane closer together and give it enough energy to become sound, audible to the human ear. This is what we can assume the Cranchy is doing, excluding any type of magnetism or electric shenanigans. Instead, the Cranchy can flex its own chitinous cuticles back and forth using its muscles in order to produce sound on its own. The muscles would be very specialized and precise in order to control the quality and timbre of sound that they produce. I assume the Cranchy simply sings and uses its speakers to amplify its voice, or perhaps give it that distorted effect. But why exactly does the Cranchy have that grungy voice? Let's talk more about that. The bio states that the Cranchy has a lovely singing voice while underwater, but has that signature inkling garble when it's above water. There are a couple of reasons how this dual singing voice can be explained. The first explanation comes with the knowledge that sound travels differently underwater. The liquid medium is proven to carry sound waves further than in air, so maybe the vocalizations from the Cranchy are modified by the water in order to coalesce harmonically and sound much sweeter to the ear. Another reason is the fact that the Cranchy might have different vocal cords than other land-dwelling monsters. Perhaps they work most effectively when saturated with water, and when on land they dry out and become the weird warbly voice we hear on Mythical Island. That makes me wonder if we ever get some sort of island where we can hear the Cranchy's true voice. 
I doubt it would happen officially, but it's a neat idea for any MSM fan creators if they wanted to give that idea a spin. But that sums up our discussion of the Cranchy. I feel complete knowing I just lore dumped about squids for approximately 3,000 words. So let's see the final print! I'm very excited for the huge array of possibilities that we can get for the rare and epic Cranchy. Rares, being more tame in their ideas, may include a cheeky reference or two, or even a nod to Cranchy Day's glass squids. I love this idea, and I hope that MSM applies it to more monster variations than just the epic sponge. Epic Cranchy could reference a million more squid types. I think it would be fun to stylize the Cranchy into a Dracula-esque monster to reference vampire squids. We may have to wait a while for these designs because I don't think rare and epic dream ethicals are coming out anytime soon. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Monster Biology. If you made it all the way through, I'd encourage you to subscribe because I would like to try to make it to 100,000 subscribers by the end of the year for some special surprises. But I can't mention those right now. You have been watching Cryptanium, and I will see you all later.